um, Professor of Physics in the Robinson Research Institute at Victoria University of Wellington, now part-time, although he also lives in Wellington, I'm afraid. He is internationally known for his research, discoveries, and commercialization of high-temperature superconductors, materials which become perfect conductors when cooled. Dr. Tallon has received many awards for his work, including the Rutherford Medal and the inaugural New Zealand Prime Minister's Medal for commercializing fundamental science. He is a companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit and has been visiting professor at Cambridge University and a visiting fellow at Trinity College, Cambridge. So please welcome. Um. Okay, well, thank you, Nicola, for the uh, invitation to speak here. Um, <coughs> I'm afraid I've only just now seen the, the title of the, uh, or taken in the title of uh, this series. Um, and it's the bit at the end in an age of disinformation. If I'd taken notice of that earlier, I might have um, focused a little bit more on that because it's a huge issue, isn't it? Mm. Um, from all directions. <coughs> and I think that's a critical issue is disinformation about the relationship between science and uh, theology of science and Christianity. Um, some of those things will emerge from what I'm going to talk about. Um, but I was asked to sort of start off uh, with black holes and uh, see where we go. Well, this year has been amazing, hasn't it? We've had a, a series of incredible images <coughs> This one here is the black hole um, envisaged for the first uh, time in the history of humankind. The black hole sitting in the centre of our own uh, Milky Way galaxy. This, of course, is Matariki, um, which we celebrated uh, as a nation for the first time in um, May. And this is one of those images uh, that Alistair referred to that uh, have come out of the James Webb uh, Space uh, Telescope. And I'll talk a little bit about this. This is Stefan's Quintet, and um, it's a set of five galaxies all clustered together uh, at the foot of Pegasus. So here they are, Sagittarius A is the name of the black hole at the center of our galaxy, Matariki or uh, Pleiades and uh, Stefan's uh, Quintet. Okay, so a few things about uh, James Webb uh, Telescope. And this is an official uh, picture uh, coming from NASA. Mm -hmm. And um, can anybody see what's wrong with this picture, even though it's an official NASA <laughs> picture? <coughs> So here's the planet Earth down, down here. Um, this is, let's go through these. This is the primary mirror, the secondary uh, mirror here. And underneath, this, um, there's a set of wafers, um, which are the size of a tennis court. Each one of those is the size of a tennis court. There are five of these wafers, and the whole point of this is this telescope is operating in the infrared. So it's beyond the red part of the spectrum. It's in the invisible part of the spectrum. But of course, anything that's a little bit warm is going to emit infrared uh, radiation. <coughs> and these are the solar cells, the battery, uh, that, that power the whole um, system. And of course, um, it's collecting that energy from the sun. So the big issue is how do you keep this assembly here um, very cold, like um, minus 230 degrees Celsius, while you're still collecting energy from the sun. And so there are these tennis court sized um, wafers here that are all separated. It's like a vacuum flask, isn't it? Because it's essentially a vacuum in between those uh, wafers. And that's all just to reduce the amount of uh, radiation which is coming through. And I think this is sitting, as I say, about 200, minus 230 uh, degrees Celsius. It's big, uh, six and a half meters in diameter. <clears throat> so it's quite a challenge sending something like this object here, the size of a tennis court, uh, up into space, fitting that inside a rocket, such that it can unfold um, all of its uh, parts. 
There are 18 of these hexagonal um, mirrors here. Each one is made from beryllium, so if you think about um, the periodic table, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, it's the fourth element. Uh, it's a very light, um, low density element, and that's the whole point of this, to get a 6.5 meter telescope up in the sky. It's got to be light, but it's got to be strong, and uh, so beryllium is used for that, and then there's a very thin coating of gold on the surface so that that acts like a mirror. The um, light comes in, it's reflected off into the secondary mirror. It goes into a tertiary mirror inside. And um, there are two collectors, one that collects in the near infrared, which is close to the visible, and, and the other major one is in the mid infrared. Um, so that's beyond uh, the near infrared. Okay, so it's, um, uh, yes, um, the question was, what's the problem with this picture? Well, the problem with this picture is Earth is here and the Sun is down here. These three, James Webb Telescope, Planet Earth and the Sun, are all in a straight line and, and it's in an orbit that sustains that um, straight line. Um, <clears throat> so the Sun is over here. Um, but the protection from the sun's radiation is here, is over the sun, we're down there. So anyhow, that's an official uh, <laughs> uh, picture from NASA. Hopefully they don't do everything uh, um, with such errors. Okay, moving on. So, um, as I say, it's the telescope or the spacecraft is located in a very special point. So here's the sun, here's planet Earth, and there are some five special locations in relation to Earth and the Sun, referred to as the Lagrange points. And this is um, the most convenient for, um, for the operation of the telescope. So from Earth to the telescope, it's one and a half um, million kilometers, so it's quite some distance. The Moon is much closer uh, to planet Earth. This, of course, is something more like 150 million kilometers from the sun uh, to the Earth. But it's lined up in this way so that at all times in its orbit, um, <coughs> the Earth and the sun's gravitational <coughs> force on the telescope is aligned perfectly. If that weren't, if it were simply orbiting planet Earth, then the sun would be perturbing that orbit uh, all the time. And of course, that would, it's absolutely crucial to have stability over long periods of time if you're looking at the very edge of the universe. So that's one of the Lagrange uh, points. Now, the, the other issue is that you've got the radiation coming from the sun. The, the Earth's Umbra, so that's the total shadow of, of the sun, um, it terminates somewhere around here. And so the telescope is sitting in the penumbra, but as it's orbiting, um, the amount of radiation that's coming on uh, the telescope is fluctuating uh, a little bit. And you don't want fluctuations in um, that radiation. So it's following an orbit here. Um, which is not a simple orbit, actually. Um, it's it's a, referred to as a halo uh, orbit, and it's got a bit of a wobble here and here. Um, and that ensures that the radiation from the sun forming on the um, uh, on on the um, <coughs> solar cells is uh, constant. And any radiation that's leaking through to the uh, telescope is constant. Okay, so it's quite complicated just getting it into <coughs> that right location, the so-called Lagrange point, and then orbiting around it. If you just um, loosely deposit something at this point here, you can see these lines of force here. That's referred to as a, a saddle point, and it's, um, it's only quasi-stable. So if you deposit something there, it'll sit there for a while, but it will decay away, and it's got a lifetime of about 27 days, and then it will slip out of that saddle point 
So this orbit here is actively controlled, so you've got to have constant supply of power um, to this craft to ensure that. Well, this was, I think, the first famous picture that um, appeared in our newspapers and on television. Um, Marvellous, uh, ultra deep field. Um, we, we heard some years ago about ultra deep field images from Hubble. Um, well, this is looking much uh, deeper. It's looking about another 300 million uh, light years deeper into uh, outer space. And that's because it's looking at in the infrared. But there are many things that you can see here. Of course, these um, these fellows here with the um, the spikes are their closest stars. Uh, but you can see many thousands, in fact, of these elongated um, fuzzy images. Each one of those is a galaxy with anything between a billion and a thousand billion stars sitting in them let's say on average 100 billion stars in each one of those uh, galaxies. The other thing you can see is that many of these images are distorted in a roughly circular um, manner. And that's because somewhere between um, that ultra deep field and us, uh, there is probably a black hole which is distorting. Um, uh, it's acting as a lens itself. Um, and as you probably know, uh, according to Einstein, gravity will bend uh, light. And uh, so that object um, is acting kind of like a lens. It's not a perfect lens, of course, but you can see many of these uh, um, following a roughly circular uh, pattern here. And just from investigating that, you can reconstruct the nature of that object um, that's between us and that more distant field. But the really uh, exciting thing is that there are a number of galaxies uh, in that ultra deep field, such as this fellow here, and a closer um, version of it. This fellow is sitting um, very, very close to the edge of time. Okay, so it's coming from uh, 13.5 billion light years um, away. Now, um, the best estimates of the of the uh, age of the of the universe is 13.82 plus or minus 0 0.02. Um, so that's just 320 million years after uh, the Big Bang. So this is pretty exciting, and it's exciting for a number of reasons. One is that. Um, it's believed that the first stars and galaxies were formed about uh, um, several hundred million years after the Big Bang. This is 300 million years after the Big Bang. So if a bigger telescope is put up into space and is able to look back deeper still, what will it see? The expectation is that it will see nothing in the distance. Of course, it will see all the same galaxies uh, more in the foreground. Um, but that's a really interesting test, isn't it? If something bigger than James Webb can be put up, what will it see out on the ultimate edge of time? I mean, this is so close to the, the very edge of um, the observable universe, the very edge of, of time, um, that it's truly astonishing. This uh, galaxy, it does have a name, I can't re recall it now, it's about a billion stars. Um, but its volume is about one hundredth of our uh, Milky Way uh, galaxy. So the density of stars in this is about ten times uh, what it is in our galaxy. The, the other interesting thing is that if you look at these very early galaxies, um, they haven't gone through the typical life, uh, lifetime of the galaxy. They haven't been um, the supernova explosions uh, and the collision of neutron stars that generate the um, heavier elements. So these very juvenile galaxies are pretty much mainly composed of um, helium and predominantly hydrogen. Um, at a level which is consistent with the primordial um, 
concentrations that were generated uh, in the first moments of the Big Bang. I'll come now to Stefan's quintet because I think this is a, a, a beautiful um, galaxy. So it's just at the foot of Pegasus. There's uh, Pegasus. Uh, what, what can we I think? So this fellow over here is Andromeda. So uh, to orient yourselves, Orion would be uh, across on the wall over there. Um, so just under the foot of Pegasus, you can't see it in that image I showed, but um, here is Stefan's qu uh, quintet. Uh, Stefan, Frenchman, um, 19th century, uh, discovered this uh, qu quintet of galaxies. And here it is um, from James Webb Space Telescope. It comprises, um, those of you who are looking carefully will see that there's a bit of a line running along here. And I just took some of this image and put it over. I didn't like having a black area there, so I just <laughs> duplicated it. So I'm uh, <coughs> trying to be honest and only up to what's happened here. And I had to stretch it a little bit to get it to the margin here. So these, these fellows here are stretched um, sideways a little bit. Uh, but this is undocted across here on the right. So this, um, there's a galaxy here which is not really part of the group. It's much closer. It's about 40 um, million light years away. I think I've got the numbers here. Yeah. 40 million light years away. This is much closer. But these one, two, three, four uh, galaxies are more distant, nearly 300 million uh, light years away. And they're so close that they're interacting. They're ripping huge quantities of matter from each other. You know, there's a really, there's a battle of the titans um, taking place in here. And it's, um, it's enhanced by the fact that there are black holes at the center of those galaxies, which are gobbling up matter at an incredible rate. <clears throat> um, this one here, NGC, uh, 7319, this is 7318, oh sorry, this is 7318B, I think, and this is 7318A. Um, the black hole, it's a supermassive black hole sitting at the centre here, um, and it's got a mass of 24 million times uh, the mass of our sun, and it has a, um, at the centre of that is a quasar, um, so that black hole, as I say, is gobbling up matter at a fantastic rate. Um, the matter, of course, when, when you let the water out of the bathtub, it doesn't just go straight down the hole, it circulates. So a little bit of angular momentum from back here gets um, multiplied up as you get closer to the plug hole. And that's what happens with the black hole. And you've got circulating matter traveling at millions of miles an hour. Um, around the black hole and then eventually being sucked in. But it's very hot, electrons are ripped off there. There's a very intense magnetic field. You put, um, you transport electrons in a magnetic field, they'll follow a curved path. That means they're accelerating um, in this direction and they'll emit radiation. And this is emitting radiation um, with an equivalent light output uh, equal to 40 billion of our suns. And it's shot out in a straight line out in this direction. I'll say a little bit more about that um, soon. This uh, came out two days ago. Did you see this uh, image? Um, absolutely beautiful, uh, hot off the press, so to speak. The so-called cartwheel uh, galaxy. Half a billion uh, light years away in the sculptor uh, constellation. And this is an image in the near infrared. Um, it's a, this, it, it, so here's a galaxy here and it looks sort of, right on the inside it looks a bit more typical, but there's this ring around here. And this is a rhythm from the collision of two um, galaxies and the shock waves that spread out from this uh, collision um, giving this outer, outer ring here. And there are spokes running out here. It's an absolutely beautiful image. A couple of other, a few other galaxies um, um, close by, and again, thousands of galaxies 
all around the, in the deeper field. That's the near infrared, but if you go to the other camera, in the mid infrared, it looks very different. <coughs> and there's a number of things that this um, shows you. First of all, in the near infrared, you can establish that there are stars which are forming from all the dust and debris that's there. It condenses together, collapses together, ignites, um, nuclear fusion uh, starts taking place, and you have the birth of stars, and that's all occurring uh, around here. On these spokes, there's um, quite a lot of organic um, matter, which isn't that always excites um, space scientists or astrobiologists. Um, I'm a bit more skeptical uh, uh, about um, extraterrestrial life, and we could talk about that for an hour, <laughs> I suppose, uh, later. Um, but in fact, it's of great interest that uh, you can observe the presence of organics in these um, spokes that are extending out here. So you can imagine that uh, images like this are um, a wonderful laboratory for testing uh, theories and coming up with new ideas as to the uh, formation and uh, evolution of, of galaxies. So I think that just illustrates how different, you know, these things look depending on what glasses you've got on. And if you look in the ultraviolet on the other side of the visible spectrum, um, then there's much more that can be learned. But that's not the job of um, uh, the James Webb telescope. Okay. So at the centre of our galaxy, far, far away, um, we're leading up to uh, this image that came up earlier in the year. You know, we think of the stars, and the ancients always spoke of the stars as fixed objects. Uh, but this is the centre of our galaxy, and it's 14 years. It's a series of images taken over 14 years. And you can see that those um, stars near the centre of the galaxy are very active and mobile, and you can see that they're orbiting something. And what they're orbiting, the axis is, is down here, what they're orbiting is this fellow that was uh, revealed, Sagittarius A, um, <coughs> using the Event Horizon Telescope. You know, the idea with the telescope is to have as large a, uh, a collecting mirror as possible, and uh, the idea with the Event Horizon Telescope I'm not sure where the horizon comes uh, from the notion I'm going to describe, but if you imagine a ball, um, then the individual telescopes are around the horizon of planet Earth. There are five of them that are scattered around them uh, at different points um, on the edge of that disk. And so it means the telescopes can look out this way or they can look out this way. And they're all sim simultaneously collecting data um, over a range, um, you know, separated by four and a half thousand uh, kilometres. So that's a big telescope, but of course there are no other telescopes in between this one and that one. But nonetheless, it's a great way of getting very high resolution. And this is the image um, of the black hole. You're still not seeing the black hole. The black hole is um, sitting here <coughs> in the centre. But as I say, you, you have all of this matter which is being drawn in, it's very hot, um, and, and so there's a lot of infrared light which is coming from around the rim of the black hole. Also, it focuses light that's beyond, that's coming from other galaxies, coming past it, focuses it into um, a ring, and we have better images coming from um, M87, which is another galaxy much more distant, and we had images last year uh, coming from us. M87 sits in Virgo, just up uh, at this point here. Um, this is Spica here. Um, this is the Sun, this is Venus. Um, so we go to that point there. And here's another one of these super massive, this is a super duper massive black hole. Um, and it's, uh, again, it has this quasar, this ejection of, uh, of radiation uh, from its centre. So, you can imagine what's happening here. The black hole is spinning 
this way, and you've got this jet of radiation that, uh, that comes out. Three and a half million kilometers per hour is the sort of typical speed at which the accretion layer is, is rotating around the center of the black hole. Here's uh, a closer up uh, version. This um, jet is about 5,000. It takes light 5,000 years to get from one end of that jet um, to the other, to the outermost um, point in it. And then it takes another 53 million years for the light to come to us on planet Earth. <clears throat> um, so you, you have around a black hole a concentration of light for the reasons that I've already mentioned, this so-called Einstein disk, um, but the black hole is spinning and so that has to be modelled and then your telescopes are not perfect, um, it, there's, it's got limitations in its resolution so you build those limitations and resolution into your image and this is the reconstructed whoa <laughs> okay so this is the um, this is the reconstructed image here and this is the observed uh, image and you'll probably recall seeing those uh, last year but the numbers are astonishing so the diameter of, of, of this uh, black hole is 106 billion kilometers, so that's 10 times the, um, the radial length of our own um, solar system. And it's, as I say, it's a super duper massive um, black hole because there's something like 6.5 billion times the mass of our sun uh, sitting uh, locked in the center of that um, of that black hole. And of course, this all, um, the only equation I'll put to you, this is Einstein's uh, gravitational uh, equation, and um, the physics of this all emerges from that equation. It took about um, 50 years for people to realize that there was such a thing as a black hole. It took 70 years to solve it for um, a spinning, uh, rotating uh, black hole, and that was a Kiwi. Uh, who, who did that? Occur, and um, now a hundred years later, we have the observation, which is astonishing. Let me just say a few things um, about Matariki before um, I wind up with some thoughts. <coughs> this uh, image here of Matariki is uh, um, that's not as you see it. This is on if you look on. Uh, Wikipedia, you'll see that image, and it was voted by the people of the world as uh, Wikipedia's uh, best image last year. And um, it's constructed from infrared and the ultraviolet, but not from the visible, so that's not uh, precisely uh, what you see. Um, let's go back. So, Again, they look stationary, they look like fixed stars in, in, in the background, but um, astronomers can measure the very tiny displacements that are taking place over time. And um, based on those current velocities and the, inter the gravitational interaction uh, between those stars, uh, you can reconstruct their pathways over a period of 400,000 years. So this next image that comes up starts off 200,000 years ago, it comes through to the present, and then it goes 200,000 years into the future. And you can see this now, and here's um, heading up to the future, starting again. This is what we see now. And it's clear, you know, that um, everything is so busy. Matariki will not uh, last forever. Um, the, uh, this kind of analysis tells you that it will disintegrate and, and separate uh, due to uh, the interaction not only with themselves but with other um, passing stars over time. So we can only celebrate Matariki maybe for another million years and uh, <laughs> we'll have to move on. <laughs> what we can do is go up and um, uh, celebrate Kwana 
then, uh, because that's concerned just with the rising of one star in, in Orion. And it still surprises me that Matariki won in the, in the race. Which do we recognize? I think the South Island Maori, uh, the <coughs> northernmost tribes, the Taranaki tribes, the Wellington tribes, um, all tended to celebrate Kawanga and not Matariki. I'm not quite sure uh, how all of that happened, but there we go. Now, it's, that's the, the, the cosmic world, um, which is truly astonishing. Um, but I always like to reflect on the fact that the microscopic world, and in particular the biological world, is at least equally astonishing. What we've just seen, to my mind, is miracle, and what we're going to see now is also miracle. Astonishing. So we can't see um, we can't see uh, DNA. I think um, you'd be able to confirm the diameter across here is about two nanometers, two billionths of a meter. There's no way that um, we can ever see this. But by a laborious process of um, X-ray diffraction, NMR, um, high resolution NMR um, measurements, synchrotron. Uh, radiation, <clears throat> the structure of all of these biological mo um, molecules has progressively um, been um, revealed. Uh, combined with that, we can model the interactions between individual atoms um, so that the mechanisms by which um, the catalysis, um, metabolism, uh, re uh, transcription of, of DNA, uh, and so on, uh, takes place. So here's a movie um, which is generated from putting all of that information together. <coughs> so here's a close up that's looking at the individual um, uh, atoms and, and molecules. These, um, these individual components that are coming in and attaching here. They are all just randomly moving around in a suit of, of, uh, of reagents. But in real time, this is the way it goes. Flat out like that, and the human body's got 100,000 um, different proteins. Just pick on one of those, hemoglobin. Every second, the bone marrow in your body makes 100 trillion hemoglobin molecules using, that's only the first stage of it, that's, uh, that's the transcription. That um, messenger RNA has to come out of the portholes in the nucleus, it's got to go up to the ribosome, it's got to then be translated uh, into proteins. 100 trillion hemoglobin uh, molecule, uh, proteins generated every second in your bone marrow. <clears throat> and that's only one of a hundred thousand other proteins that are generated. So humankind has been able to look out into the vast expanses of space and see back to the very edge of time. Uh, humankind has also been able to look into this microscopic world and uh, discover uh, a, a world which is equally remarkable uh, and astonishing. I went, I put this and the images to one side. I was going to say a little bit more about Matariki, but um, we want to um, draw things to a point. So, the distinctive thing about all of these uh, images um, is that they're invisible to the eye, as I've been saying. They're not just invisible to the eye um, because they're so tiny, um, finer than any possible resolution of the human eye, but because they're incredibly faint and you need very special uh, telescopes to pick up um, those very few um, small number of photons that are uh, coming to us from the very edges of time. Uh, but also because they're taken from outside of the visible spectrum. Um, all of the James Webb images are in the infrared and indeed much of modern astronomy and cosmology is concerned with making the invisible visible. As I said, we've just recently celebrated Matariki 
much of much of Reiki is invisible to the naked eye. You can see what seven to nine stars when you look directly at it. When Galileo first trained his uh, telescope on Pleiades, um, he counted 36 stars, and now we know that there are many thousands. And you saw some of them in that in that um, movie extending over 400,000 years. Nowadays, we can see the invisible, can't we? There's much more to the world than meets the eye. And I think at heart, seeing the unseen lies at the very heart of our humanity. I'll say that again. Seeing the unseen lies at the very heart of our humanity. Certainly it drives the entire scientific enterprise. We make tools to render the invisible visible. We develop mathematics to make the unfathomable fathomable. But as humans, we do not merely respond to our immediate circumstances reactively in knee-jerk fashion. But we transport ourselves out of those circumstances to consider a wider perspective be that with an eye to the imagined future, or to consequences, or to insights, or to the other person's perspective. We see the unseen in every situation we find ourselves, and we govern our actions accordingly. As I say, much of what we do is with an eye to the future, or we dig deeper to try to understand what we do not yet understand, or we interpret what is in front of our eyes to create deeper meaning. Think about it. Seeing the unseen drives our response to the law. We are aware of consequences. Seeing the unseen drives our unstoppable urge for art and creative expression. The very word art comes from the root ars, which means to join. We join the visible to the invisible. And that's the expression of art. The role of the art. It drives our attitudes to training for education and sport. Think of all of those athletes in Birmingham uh, who have worked for years, not for the present, uh, but for the future outcome. <clears throat> and it drives, of course, our human urge for religion, which is universal. To attempt to understand our place in the cosmos and to respond accordingly. Now, of course, we all begin our lives purely reactively. I'm hungry, I'm hurting, I'm tired, I'm thirsty, and we hear about it uh, from our little ones, don't we? don't we? We demand accordingly, but quite rapidly we grow up transporting ourselves into a conceptual and abstract world that takes us beyond the immediate and begins to dictate a less reactive, more measured behavior. Some of us grow up faster than others. I love to think of those Babylonian astronomers more than two and a half thousand years ago who calculated an eclipse had occurred below the horizon. They record precisely where it occurred in the sky, when it occurred, and for how long. And then they record I did not see it. It was below the horizon. And that's a huge leap for humanity, isn't it? To realize that an abstract mathematical calculation on paper or on clay, on clay tablets corresponds to physical reality, even if not actually seen. Seeing the unseen. Or consider Eratosthenes, about 200 BC, who by measuring the angle of the sun's shadow on Midsummer's Day in Alexandria and at Aswan, accurately concluded that planet Earth was a sphere with a circumference of 40,000 kilometers, as we know it to be today. Seeing the unseen. Humankind has developed in our own time the astonishing capacity to see out to the very edge of time and to the very edge of the observable universe. And not just see, but perceive. 
that is to say, to understand what is going on in these remote borders of space-time and what is their impact on our own locality in space-time. We as humans occupy a unique position in the universe in that we are the only sapient beings that we know of that are capable of comprehending our position in it. We must also seriously ponder the likelihood that we are indeed the only such sapient beings, not only in our galaxy, but in the entire universe. As a recent study in, in Oxford concluded. So this surely crowns humankind with a unique status, but also with a unique responsibility. Does that status derive from a creator in whose image we are made? Many included, I included, would say yes. Others would urge us to consider the immensity of the cosmos and our own minuscule place in it. What immense wastefulness, they would say, of the cosmos and our own minuscule, I'm sorry, what immense wastefulness to fling out into space hundreds of billions of galaxies each containing hundreds of billions of stars for the sake of one tiny speck within its vastness. And yet we know from physics that this immensity and this vast age is necessary for us to exist now. And remember this enormity of space and time now lies entirely within our intellectual grasp. Nothing it would seem as beyond our ultimate comprehension. Maybe. Seeing the unseen. As a Christian, I hold to the view that there is more to life than what we see in the physical realm. Truth is not confined to physical reality, but reaches deep into the unseen, from which we derive moral sensibility and a profound sense of place and meaning. And if indeed the physical universe is created, then ultimate truth surely is to be found in the search for its creator. We as humans build our lives around the as yet unseen, and it is only natural that we should reach out to the ultimate unseen. Just as there are disciplines to establishing truth in the physical scientific realm, there must be disciplines in the search for truth in the spiritual realm. It cannot be open slather, otherwise silliness often prevails, as we well know. Data, evidence, peer review and commitment are all required in this most paramount of searches. As Jeremiah stated two and a half thousand years ago, you will surely find me when you seek for me and seek for me with all your heart.